Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to BrotherLance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. BrotherLance.com So let's let's just jump in. It says, so Jesus knocks at our door. Revelation 3, 20 through 21. He says, behold, I stand at the door knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will give to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Right. So Jesus knocks. He says, behold, I stand at the door knocking, you know. Let us remember that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepares a wedding feast. And I put, read Matthew 22, 2 through 14. And so, but the verse is Matthew 2, uh, 22. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage feast for his son. Let's look at the greeting. So you come to the meeting. Jesus comes to your house. You go to the banquet. However, this is the traditional greeting. Okay. So the order is bow. You bow to them. You wash their feet. You give water to drink. Give a holy kiss and anoint their head. Right. So let's look at Jesus references. Luke 7, 44 through 46. If you love Jesus, if you're inviting Jesus for dinner, just realize you're invited the entire body of Christ with you. And that that same honor, that same love, that same respect you give Jesus is what you have to give the body of Christ. Failure to do so is not only hurting the body, it's hurting Jesus, and it's hurting you because you were not built for selfishness. You were built to be machines and operators of love. BrotherLamps.com Dear Father, we praise you and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for protecting us from these storms. We rebuke tornadoes in the name of Jesus Christ. We rebuke hail in the name of Jesus Christ. You do not let it come against us or those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We exalt you. We lift you up. Please be with our Bible study. Give us direction and guidance and help us to think deeply about our topic today. And uh, so we'll give us the Holy Spirit, God's truth, and thank for your love. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. 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 So today we are talking about if Jesus came to dinner. And so let's read. It says, if Jesus came to dinner, how would you handle it? What would you do? What would you serve and how would it be served? How do you think your actions would convey your feelings towards him? Today we're going to look at this in the customs of the day. When Jesus was invited to dinner and when he uh, when he held his own, his dinner. And so I'm going to go around the table. We'll just briefly talk just a minute. Uh, Angel, if Jesus came to dinner, how would you handle that situation? I would feed him enchiladas. Enchiladas. <laughs> yep, homemade tortillas. We'd sit down and talk just like a family. There you go. Uh, how about you, Cody? If Jesus came to dinner, what would you do? Uh, apologize a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anything else? He might be hungry. He's coming for dinner. So what are you going to do? Uh, firing up the grill. Firing up the grill. Anything else? Uh, more apologies. <laughs> how about you, Lori? If Jesus came to dinner, what would you do? Uh, That's a good one. Anybody else? Mom, if uh, Jesus came to dinner, what would you do? No, I would wash his feet, beg his forgiveness, and then probably serve a massive dinner. There you go. How about you, Sarah? I'd be a nervous wreck the whole (laughs) entire time. (laughs) You'd be sitting there thinking, I know you're knowing what I'm thinking. You're reading my thoughts, aren't you? And if you're... You would overanalyze. <laughs> That's well, awesome. first I would have to like confirm before I let him in. Well, of course, but if you knew for sure, right? <laughs> and so my point is this. So like if we invite people into our house, if people come to dinner, if people come to our place, what do we do? We show them honor. We show them respect, right? We, uh, we try to let them feel welcome. 
We look past any inconveniences, you know, that might happen because they've come. You're right. And so, like, in my family, like, uh, we try to always go outside and see people when they come. We always try to go outside and see them when they go. And then if we know people are coming, we save which might not be the best for other people. But the best food that we have, we save that when we know for when co uh, company is coming, right, to honor them and to give them our very best, right? And so that's what we'd want to do with Jesus. If Jesus came to our house, we would obviously try to make sure the house is clean, greet him politely, Show him respect, honor him, right? These things, right? We all in agreement on that? We wouldn't just be yeah. like, yeah, food's in the kitchen. See you later, right? You'd just be like, whatever you could do to let him feel loved and stuff. And so what we're going to look at and the way this Bible study came about is like literally, because uh, normally when I make these Bible studies, I'm like, okay, God, what are we doing? And then he'd give me uh, some Bible verses and off I go. And all I could, so this is on Sabbath. All I got from this one is, if Jesus came to dinner, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, what do you want me to do with that? So I fought with that one for a while. I'm like, that makes no sense. And I tried to work on other Bible studies. And I was like, we could do this. I just didn't feel inspired on any of it. So I'm like, well, I ain't doing that. And so here we are. So let's, let's just jump in. It says, so Jesus knocks at our door. Revelation 3, 20 through 21. He says, behold, I stand at the door knocking. and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will give to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Right? So Jesus knocks. He says, behold, I stand at the door knock. You know. Right. And so the next verse is, we must knock at Jesus's door. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. Right? And so what do we have here? Jesus is like saying, I'm knocking at your door. You need to be knocking at my door. Right? And so... That's the kind of thing that we want to understand is that God and Jesus are looking for a two-way relationship. It goes both ways. Unfortunately, in Christianity, most of it's a one-way relationship. Jesus, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to bless me? How are you going to answer my prayers? How are you going to take care of my problems? How are you going to give me the warm fuzzies? Right, But that's not a true relationship. A true relationship is both ways, both parties knocking at both doors, okay? And so I put up here, it says, For the manners and the customs presented, I use the following words. The Essential Manners and Customs by Ralph Gower, and then the New Manners and Customs of the Bible by James M. Freeman. So those that's my source material for the customs that we're going to be reading about. So I put, Let us remember that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepares a wedding feast. And I put, Read Matthew 22. 2 through 14 and so but the verse is matthew 2 uh, 22 2 the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage feast for his son right and so the basis god is trying to convey is that like this listen god the kingdom of heaven is like like you know a party a banquet a reception right and it really lays a ground a groundwork of being invited coming in having your wedding clothes on you know, getting your right seating being presented with the blessings of the food and all these things right so he really wants us to focus on like if jesus came for dinner or if we went to jesus's house for dinner that's just basically what we're talking about both parties knocking right so let's look right here it says we must keep in mind that feast banquets and dinners are were often present when covenants and binding agreements were made clearly we could see this in the the Passover meal that Jesus partook with his disciples. So Joshua 9, 14 through 16 says this, the men sampled their provisions and didn't ask counsel from Yahweh's mouth. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. The peace uh, princes of the congregation were to them. At the end of the three days, they had made a covenant with them and they heard, uh, heard that they were their neighbors and they lived among them, right? And so in that little uh, area right there that we talked about, Joshua was having dinner with them. He ate a meal. He broke bread with them, right? Now, this is an example of a failure because they didn't inquire of God. So that was kind of like the historical tradition of eating and making agreements. But here we have at the top of page two, it says, as we can see here, this is exactly what Jesus did at the Lord's Supper. So Matthew 26, 27 through 28, he says, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave them to saying, All of you drink it, for this is the my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, the remissions of sin. So at the new at the uh, Passover meal, which became the Lord's Supper, he is making an agreement at this meal. 
right? So if Jesus came for dinner, so he's here right now at the Lord's Supper saying, this is my bread, this is my body, and it's the bread, broken for you, eat this, this is my blood, and he's making an agreement, okay? And so now that we know that the importance of what, like, you know, a very surface level, we're not going too deep, but of the, the importance of a meal, the importance of inviting people in for banquets and parties and such, to make agreements, to set up things, and it also helps us understand what Jesus was doing. And so this whole study isn't really on Passover, but you'll see a lot of Passover stuff in here because you'll see Jesus doing these steps that were tradition. So let's look at the greeting. So you come to the meeting, Jesus comes to your house, you go to the banquet, however, this is the traditional greeting, okay? So the order is bow, you bow to them, you wash their feet, you give water to drink, give a holy kiss and anoint their head, right? So let's look at Jesus references, Luke 7, 44 through 46. He says, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? And I entered into your house. And so here's the bullet for it. And you gave me no water for my feet. Didn't wash his feet. But she was, she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. Verse 45, you gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came, has not uh, ceased to kiss my feet. And then 46, you didn't anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. And so I put some references here for you to go and look these things up. It's Genesis 18.4, Judges 19.21, 1 Samuel 10.1, Romans 10, 6, uh, Romans 16.16, 16, sorry, and Psalms 23.5 for more. So they didn't wash or allow Jesus to wash his feet to remove the, remove the dirt and grime of the streets and the pathways, forcing him to sit at the meal dirty and unwashed. So keep that in mind. When Mary was washing his feet, his very dirty feet, walking away with the filth of the earth stuck to her hair contaminating her head jesus came in dirty they didn't wash his feet so she's sitting there anointing and kissing and with tears wiping her hair all over his feet kissing dirty yucky feet okay and so what's happening is, is in, in israel and stuff they have dirt roads right and then they have feces on the ground from animals and the dust getting kicked up and bugs and all the yuck and Whatever else drops on the ground, right? And so they failed to wash Jesus' feet. They did not show him the traditional honor and respect a, 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 an esteemed guest would receive, okay? So let's keep going. It says, we can assume they did the customary bow as it was not mentioned as missing. So let's find a tradition on that. Genesis 18, 2 through 3. He lifted up his eyes and looked and saw that three men stood near when he saw them. He ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down, bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please don't go away from your servant. All right. And so it says, as we see, the lady must be bowing to use her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. So Luke 7, 37 through 38. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment, standing behind at his feet weeping she began to wet his hair with her tears and she wiped them with her hair of her head kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment okay now we can assume now that's beautiful and, and that's the respect jesus should have been given but it wasn't given him okay and real fast two things the tradition in, in invite i read was you would be invited to a party. The customary response to a banquet is, I am not worthy to come to your party. That was the customary thing, like, thank you for your invite. I'm not worthy of your house. And that put it back on the owner of the house to then again inquire of you again to show up and then bless you to be there, right? And so that was the thing. Now, the other thing you need to know is to not be anointed with oil in the Bible was also a sign of mourning. That you, if you refrain from being anointed, you were mourning, right? And so what did they do to Jesus here? They didn't allow him to be clean, right? His feet. They didn't anoint him, right? So really what they're doing is he may be given a sign of uh, mourning and, and, and rejection by pretending to accept him, right? So they're putting him in a very like socially awkward situation, because everybody knows these these guidelines to uh, parties at the time, right? Jesus is not, a, he knew what he was doing. And so he pointed out all the things that weren't done for him, right? And so he was not being esteemed as he should. So, uh, so we can assume they gave him drink as it was not mentioned as missing. So the bow we can assume was there and we can assume the drink was there. Okay, Genesis 24, 17 to 18 says, The servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a drink, a little water from your pitcher. She said, Drink, my lord. She'd hurried and let down her pitcher on her hand, her hand and gave him drink. 
Okay, and then the verse, Mark 9, 41 says, Forever will give a cup of water to drink in my name because you are Christ. Christ, most certainly I tell you, he will no way lose his reward. So back then, to give a drink was a sign of honor. If I gave you a drink of water, it was to honor you. That means I was esteeming you. So we can see in, in the Passover thing, when Jesus is handing out the, the, the wine, you know, this is my blood. That was an act of being esteemed by Jesus, being honored by him. That Like, listen, I gave you this drink. You know, and so I read that there was a tradition and most of you like Cody's been baptized by me and uh, Angel's been baptized by me. That's where I got the drink offering, the drink ceremony from, because in these books I was reading, this guy mentions that ceremony that he was that went to a guy's house in India. And uh, one of the things they did is he walked in and they just doused him with oil, perfumed oil. And then he held the cup. And then they just kept pouring liquid in it to it just kept overflowing and overflowing. And he told them, this, he basically said, in my house, you will find many provisions for all your needs. In other words, it was a way to honor him that like, listen, you are so welcome here. I want you to be here, you know, uh, be blessed, you know. And so he's lifting them up. OK, so let's look at top of page three. Table placement. So during the time of Israel and Judah, they set the tables in which was called the triclinium. I think I'm getting that right. Three tables were set around a square with access to the middle gained through the side for servants to come and add and take away food. Couches were arranged along the outside of the tables. Guests were given cushions to recline and relax on these elevated couches, right? And so the triclinium, I'm guessing I'm getting that right. And so you have these three different sections and a way for the servants to go into the middle and to provide the food. Everybody's normally laying out and relaxed on cushions, okay? So as we see here, Jesus and John were reclining together. This will help these verses make more sense to us. John 13, 22 through 26 says, the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was at the table, leaning against Jesus' breast. And they said, so what happened was, before we go any further, what John was leaning against Jesus' breast, they said that was typical because since you were more laid out, in order to turn and have conversations, men would wind up just laying on top of each other. They wouldn't amount to. They'd rest their head on their back, on their chest. It was not a big deal like it is today where everything's so overly sexualized that men can't hug each other or put their arms around each other or... Yeah, it was like, it, you know, back then men would always sleep together. It was not a big deal. Actually, I read that it was rude to let a guest sleep alone and that you had to either sleep in the room or sleep in the bed with them just so they would not be lonely. But now, you know, well, you must be gay. No, well, that everybody's so overly sexualized, they can't understand a courtesy, you know. And so I, I liken it to a bunch of beagles who lay all over each other. My old dog, Schooner, he would come lay on you, and he didn't care if you laid on him. I could put my head, leg, arm, or anything. He'd just be like, okay, that's what we do. you know. And so this is why John was close to Jesus, right? probably sitting on the same couch or right next to the same couch that he was on, reclining around these tables and leaned up against Jesus. Not a big deal. Nobody thought anything of it. It's not, it's, it was normal. Okay, so verse 24, Simon Peter, uh, but therefore uh, beckoned to him and said, tell us who it is, who he speaks. He leaning back as he was on Jesus' breast, asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, it is him who I give this piece of bread and I have dipped. So when he dipped that piece of bread, he gave it to Jesus, the son of Simon Iscariot. Remember this dip. This dip is important. Okay, so let's go on. This sets up, uh, uh, this setup allowed the servant to wash the feet of the guests while they were continuing their banquet. This very same setup could have been used by Jesus when he washed the disciples' feet, right? So let's look at that. So normal, you'd come in there, you'd get your greeting, you get your foot washing or water and stuff, but your feet could become dirty or whatever, and they would come and they could wash while you relax. Okay, so let's read John 13, 3 through 17. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands, that he came from God and was going to God, arose from supper, laid aside his outer garment, he took a towel and wrapped a towel around his waist. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Then he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered said, you don't know what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, 
If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said, someone who was bathed only needs to have his feet washed, but is completely the king. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who, him who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had uh, washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and sat down again. He said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you say so correctly, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also have to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Most certainly, I tell you, servants are not greater than his Lord, neither is one who is greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them, right? And so this could be the possible setup with the triclinium and Jesus and everybody's reclining. It's the status quo of the day is how they were doing it, right? And if it's funny, if you look into the New Testament, a widow was not to be a part of the ones who got portioned from the offerings unless she was one who washed the saints' feet. In other words, she knew how to serve. It also talks about having had children or served and all these things that basically she had to be humble. She had to serve, you know. And so the washing of the feet is a very important tradition. You know, it still is now for Christians. But back then in their society, it's really important. Right. And so the seat of honor, top of page four. Matthew 23, 6. And they love the first couch at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues, right? And I'll read this next one. Luke 14, 8 through 10. When you are invited by anyone to a wedding, do not recline in the chief seat, lest a more honorable man that you may be invited uh, by him. And who and he who invited you and him shall come and say to you, give place to this man. Then you begin to, with shame to take the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline in the lowest place. So when he has invited you, comes, he, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then glory shall be to you before those reclining with you. And so I'll put a little note here. I'll just go and read it. It says the place to the immediate right is the highest place of honor. So if like if we are having a feast or a party, the highest place of honor is to put the guests at your right. And then, you know, another place of honor was at the left. But the most highest honor is like, you know, if Jesus came to your house, you'd want to put him on your right side. Right. And that's where you'd want him to be. And so let's read Matthew 10, 36 through 40. He said to them, what do you want for me to do for you? They said to him, grant to us that we may sit one at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. But Jesus said to him, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and do baptize with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, you are able. Jesus said to them, you shall indeed drink the cup that I drink and shall be baptized with the baptized I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and in my left hand is not mine to give, but for whom it has been prepared. So. Real quick question. Where does Jesus sit at in the throne? At the right hand of God, right? And that's why that's so important. Everybody back then knew exactly what that means. That's just like not an arbitrary location. It was it was the way to say that Jesus is the highest honored, right? So a after Jesus is there, it doesn't matter who sits next because Jesus already got the top spot, right? And so that's where we would want to do it. So we talked about the dipping. Let's look at this. The token, the morsel. Said so the honored guest was given a token meal by the host of the banquet. They used a piece of bread as a spoon and dipped it in the presented food. Then it was fed to the most honored guest. It was called the morsel. Said so this was the first meal or Passover, John 13, 26 through 27. Jesus therefore answered, Is it 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 is he to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it? So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the piece of bread, then Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said uh, to him, what you do, do quickly. So Jesus could quite possibly have been giving him the token meal, the piece of bread, the morsel that you give an, an extension to an honored guest, right? But here we have Judas during the Passover meal, you know, the devil fills his heart. But we see this again. So say, we see this again in the Lord's Supper given to all the disciples. Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks for it and broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. Right? So here we have the whole thing playing out again. And it's almost like saying the old is done away with. It has failed. And now the new has come. Because Jesus is our Passover lamb. Right? And so uh, now that Jesus has instituted this new thing, he gives a new morsel. But now, just like with the drink, he's giving it to all the disciples, just like the uh, drink offering that people give to their guests. And he gives them the drink. You know, he's doing the morsel. 
right, the bread to all of the guests, you know, and so to the 11 disciples that are present. So, Cena, the main dinner was called the Cena. It was three courses and made to be beautiful. The guests would eat with their fingers unless it was soups, eggs, or shellfish. They would use spoons to end it. There was a dessert of pastry and fruit. So it was called the Cena. Okay, so let's look at the top of page five. It says, after the meal, there was a time of entertainment with songs and reading of poetry. Proverbs were exchanged along with much conversation. So let's see some examples. Amos 6, 4 through 6. Who lie on beds of ivory and stretch. Now, this is God like saying these, these are their traditions, but this is a bad example of people doing it badly. But this is their traditions, okay? Who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves on their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the middle of the stall, who strum on the strings of their hearts, who invent for themselves instruments like of music, like David, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the best oil, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph, right? So, why it's a bad example of people doing bad. This was a, the first example I found of these traditions going on in Scripture, the lying down, being anointed, having drink, you know, doing the whole routine here. Okay, so let's look. It says John 13, 31 through 35. So much conversation. So Jesus has now done the morsel. He's done the, the, the drink, right, to, to his guests. He washed their feet, right, and then he gave them the, the morsel, which is the bread. He gave, he's giving them the drink. Okay, and now what it, what happens after that? Oh, there's entertainment. So here we go. So entertainment back then could be proverbs, proverbs, songs. It could be dance. It could be anything, right? Whatever the the host of the party wanted it to be, that's what it was because his job was to entertain. So John thirteen thirty one through thirty five. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him immediately. Little children, I will be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and then as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I tell you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I loved you, you also love one another by this... Everyone will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So what did we talk about? New covenants, new agreements being made at dinners. This is one of those things like, listen, a new commandment, a new gr agreement is being made right now. This is what I want you to do. You have to love each other. Okay, let's keep going. John 14, 1 through 31. It says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you. So just, just as Jesus going, okay, I got a new contract. This is the new covenant. This is what I want you to do. This is what you're going to get. You know, he's like laying it all out. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, you may be there also. Where I go, you know, and you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father that we will uh, be enough for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you such a long time and do you not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I tell you, I speak not for myself, but the Father who lives in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Also believe me for the very work's sake. Most certainly I tell you, he who believes me, the works that I do, he will also do. And he will do greater works than these because I am going to my Father. But whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Right, it's part of the agreement that my father may be glorified in the son. For if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. So there's a new commandment, love each other. If you love me, keep my commandments. I'll pray to the father and I'll give you another counselor. So who gets the counselor? The commandment keepers, those who love each other. 16, I will pray to the Father who will give you another counselor that he may be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, for it doesn't see him, neither knows him. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you yet a little while. And top of page six. Everybody a second to flip. It says, I'll wait for Daniel here. It says, the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know I am in the Father and you and me and I in you. One who has my commandments and keeps them, that person is the one who loves me. So how do we love Jesus, guys? 
to keep the commandments. You cannot love God without keeping the commandments. The Bible says you're a liar if you say you do, and but you don't keep the commandments. Okay? <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. One who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. 22. Judas, not as scary, said to him, Lord, what has happened that you're about to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. My father will love him, and I will come to him and make my home with him. He who doesn't love me doesn't keep my words. The words which you hear are not mine, but the father who sent me. I have said these things to you while still living with you. But the counselor, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will remind you of all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let it be fearful. You have heard how I told you I will go away and then come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I said I'm going to my father for the father is greater than I. Now I've told you before it happens so that when it happens you may believe. I will no more speak much with you for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me but that which the world may know that I love the father and the father commanded me even so I do. Arise, let's go from here. So I said for the remainder of the conversation read John chapter 15 through 17 right so this is Jesus fulfilling the entertainment part or the discussion part the covenant part of the the societal routine or with the status quo of what we do at parties and get-togethers right okay so now we talked about what happens they have entertainment so they saw there's a song it's called the Hillel was a song sang after Passover that was comprised of Psalms 113 through 118 from the Adam, Adam Clark commentary, as to the hymn itself, we know that from the universal consent of Jewish antiquity that it was composed of Psalms 113, 1 through 9, Psalms 114, 1 through 8, Psalms 115, Psalms 116, Psalms 117, 1 through 2, and Psalms 18, turned by the Jews, halal, from the hallelujah. Right? So it is thought that since Jesus was the host of the Passover, he would have recited lines of the song and the rest would re respond with the refrain, praise the Lord or hallelujah. All right? So here we go. Matthew 26, 30 says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out of the Mount to the Mount of Olives. Right? And so I got the song here and I'm going to, I'm going to read a verse and I want you guys to go. Praise the Lord. And I'll read the next verse. We're going to do what they did because I just thought that would be really fun. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I'm going to read a verse and I'll get quiet and then you guys say praise the Lord. Okay. So it says here is Psalms 118. Let's do the same, uh, do it the same way Jesus might have. Psalms 118, 1 through 29, verse 1. Give thanks to, the, uh, to Yahweh for he is good for his loving kindness endures forever. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. There you go. Verse 2. Let Israel now say that his loving kindness endures forever. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Yeah. Verse 3. Let the house of Aaron now say that his loving kindness endures forever. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Yeah. Verse 4. Now let those who fear Yahweh say that his loving kindness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Verse 5. Out of my distress I called on Yah, and Yah answered me with freedom. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, there we go. Verse 6. Yahweh is on my side. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Praise the, Praise Lord. the Lord. Amen. Verse 7. Yahweh is on my side among those who help me. Therefore, I will look in triumph at those who hate me. Praise the, Praise Lord. the Lord. Amen. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to put confidence in man. Amen. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. Yep. Verse nine. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to put confidence in princes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse ten. All the nations surrounded me, but Yah, but in Yahweh's name I cut them off. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. That's right. Uh, verse eleven. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In Yahweh's name I indeed cut them off. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There you go. Verse 12. They surrounded me like bees. <laughs> they quenched like the burning thorns in Yahweh's name. I cut them off. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise, Praise God. God. Praise yeah. Lord. yeah. Verse 13. You pushed me back hard to make me fall, but Yahweh helped me. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Amen. Verse 14. Yah is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of Yahweh does valiantly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, verse 16. The right hand of Yahweh is exalted. The right hand of Yahweh does valiantly. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. the Lord. Amen. I will not die, but live and declare Yah's works. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yah has punished me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. <laughs> yep. Verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter into them. I will give thanks to Yah. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 20. This is the gate of Yahweh. The righteous will enter into it. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. <laughs> I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Praise the Lord. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. That's right. Lord. This is Yahweh's doing. It's a marvelous in our eyes. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise, praise the, the Lord. 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 Yep, this is the day that the Lord, Yahweh has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. 25. Save us now. We beg you. Yahweh, Yahweh, we beg you. Send prosperity now. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. That's right. Blessed is you who comes in Yahweh's name. We have blessed you out of Yahweh's house. Oh, praise the praise Lord. 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 27. Yahweh is God and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. Mm, praise praise the, Lord. the Lord. You are wow. you are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, praise the praise Lord. The praise Lord. the Lord. All right. And 29. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh for he is good for his loving and kindness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. So now if you go back. It's a very it's a very powerful thing because if you read the all of Hillel that we just read, Jesus was foretelling his death and resurrection in the in the Hillel, right? I shall not uh, die but live and declare. Behold, the chief cornerstone. So when Jesus is reciting all these things, he's actually being prophetic, and then and then the disciples are in uh, are in agreement with him. Now the Jews have been doing this for a long time; they didn't really know what they were doing. But if you go back and try to pick out the ones, which I should have highlighted them to make it a little easy on myself, but that would be a good, like, you know, homework for you guys. Go back, read all of Hillel, and see all the ones that apply to Jesus because he was prophesying, right? And so even that part, like, you have, like, you know, punished me severely, you know, and that kind of stuff. So anyways, that's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. So top of page eight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> top of page eight. It says, remain timely. It was considered rude to leave earlier than when the host had planned. So Judges 19, 4 through 11 says, and his, fa his father-in-law, the young lady's father, kept him there and stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and stayed there. On the fourth day, they got up early in the morning and he rose up to depart. The young lady's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread. We know what the morsel is, right? That's the morsel of honor. Afterwards, you shall go your way. So they sat down, ate and drank, and both of them together. Then the young lady's father said to the man, Please be pleased to stay all night and let your heart be merry. The man rose up to depart, but his father-in-law urged him, and he stayed there again. He rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, and the young lady's father said, Please strengthen your heart and stay until the day <laughs> declines. And they both ate. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servants and his father-in-law, the young lady's father-in-law, said to him, Behold, now the day draws towards evening. Please stay all night. Behold, the day is ending. Stay here that your heart may be merry, and tomorrow you can go on your way early that you may go home. But the man wouldn't stay that night, but he rose up and departed towards Jebu, also called Jerusalem. With him were a couple of saddled donkeys. His concubine was with him also. And when they were uh, by Jabez, the day was far spent, and the servant said to the master, Please and come, let us enter into the city of Jebusites and stay here. Right? So you see this thing where, like, if you're at a banquet or a party, you are not released <laughs> until the, the one who's having the party or the banquet says, okay, you can go. Now, remember at the beginning of the thing, it said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who held a marriage feast for his son. So if you're part of the marriage supper of the lamb, you are not on your, you're being blessed, you're being fed, you're being taken care of for, you're being entertained, there's things going on, but you don't just get to get up and leave, right? Because it would be considered what? Rude. All right, it'd be like coming to my house and my wife makes this big dinner and as she's putting on the table for you to eat, you go, I got to go. Okay. You know, and then my wife worked all day to make this pot roaster stew or, you know, Cody smoked brisket or something. And it just took all night, all day and you come to eat and then I got to go. 
It, so rude. it would be a slap in the face, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so you're not on your own timing. So this is where we see here. It says John 14, 31. But then the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father commanded me, even so I do. Arise, let's go from here. This is Jesus saying this party is commencing. We're we're done. You know, John 18, uh, 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, and into his disciples entered, right? And so Jesus was like, okay, guys, we did all the things. We left with singing. I made the covenant. I anointed you, basically. I can buy wash your feet, and I gave you the morsel, and I gave you the drink, and, you know, I've said all these blessings over you. We can leave now, right? And so let's keep that in, keep this in mind, okay? So let's look at a misunderstanding. Martha and Mary. Mary and Martha. Martha misunderstood who was serving who. Jesus being the bread of life was giving the feast of the words of life. So Luke 10, 38 through 42. As they went on their way, he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Right? She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Ask her therefore to help me. Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Right? And so Martha was confused about what, who was serving who? So let's look at uh, the uh, Bible verses we got here. It says, Jesus is the bread of life. John 6, 51. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Yes, the bread which I give for the life of this world is my flesh. Right? So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And at the top of page 9, it says, Jesus is the word of life. John 6, 68, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. So Jesus is tell, telling Martha that like, listen, Mary's got it right because this feast isn't a physical feast. It's a spiritual feast and she's doing the right thing. Now, Mary, knowing the traditions of the time, was still stuck in the flesh and thinking of the things she had to do to honor Jesus as a guest. Mm -hmm. But she didn't understand whose timeline they were on and what was really happening here. And that's why Jesus corrected her and be like, listen, no, this is the most important feast that in, in the service right now. And you need to come and be served and receive these things. Right. In other words, take a step back. But I wanted to give Martha some credit. So I put later, Martha got it right. John 12, 2. So they made him a supper there. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with them. Right. So there was an appropriate time. Jesus did the miracle, raised him, you know, all stuff. And so now there's a appropriate time to, for Martha to do her part. Right. And I'm assuming it's the same Martha. And so um, uh, we have to uh, understand the time and the place, what season we are in, what is actually going on. So the whole point of this and the whole grasp of this study is like if Jesus came to dinner. Right. And so I put this final thing right here. We would honor Jesus. We would love Jesus. If we were alive at that time, we would do these things for Jesus. Right. So let's read. It says first John, as we close first John 15 through 21, it says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We know and have believed that the love which God has for us, God is love and he who remains in him, in him loves, uh, remains in God and God remains in him. And this, Love has been made perfect among us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, even so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has punishment. He who has fear is not made complete in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man says, and here's the kicker, guys, if a man says, I love God or I love Jesus and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment we have from him that he who loves God should also love his brother. So what was part of the covenant that Jesus made with the disciples at Passover? To love one another. New commandment I, I give to you to love one another. And so we just did this whole Bible study of tradition of how to have a party, how to honor your guests, how to exalt them, how to serve them, how to anoint them and wash them and feed them, entertain them, right? And so we think about it, well, if Jesus comes to dinner, this is what I would do for Jesus. Everything you think in your hearts and your minds and you said earlier that you would do for Jesus, if you're not doing it for each other, you're a bunch of liars. And you need to repent of it. Okay, and that's the facts. 
Because every if we can sit here and say, God, I love you. Oh, Jesus, I love you. I praise you. I worship you. But if you're not loving the body of Christ, mm -mm. the Bible calls you a liar. It calls me a liar. And so we have to put, hold on a second. We have to make sure we focus what we do in life and our relationships outwardly. There is a lot of being consumed or overwhelmed with our own personal lives in the world, in the church, and in this group. Where people are not still not getting on group me, still not sending texts to each other, still not being available for each other. So don't tell me all the things you would do for Jesus if you won't do it for each other. You are not making God and Jesus happy if you're not prioritizing one another over yourself. How many times? Well, that's just not me. That's not what I do. Who cares? That's how why we're given the spirit of self-control. Guess what Lance is? Lance is a sinner. Lance is not a saint. I'm a saint because Jesus made me one. But by my very nature, I am a sinner. But I can't go, well, that's the way I am. That's what I do. No, that doesn't work. What works is going by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lance becomes a new man, a new creation of Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. We do things differently now, and I can never use an excuse of that's how I am, or that's the way I am, or that's just not me. That's right. What a bunch of junk. And this group has grown and fallen apart and grown and fallen apart. And we're like in another phase of falling apart because people are so selfish. Everybody's consumed with their own problems in their own lives and their own things that's going on. And I can only do so much. Now imagine me, I'm trying to get my life and keep my life together. And then I'm trying to help everybody I know in their lives, keep their lives together and help tackle their problems. That's how we all should be. I'm not the example. I'm following the example of Jesus. How many times did he have to go out and minister tired and worn out and hungry? But the scripture says he's had compassion on the people and all he wanted to do was get away and be with God. But no, nope, he didn't do that. He goes, no, the people need me. So nowhere in scripture, we, we talked about this in the sermon, the heart of God. And here we are doing it again because we still can't get it right. And now we have people leaving the group. I mean, I could sit here and I won't because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I could sit here and lay, and lay out every single one of your guys' problems. Why do I know this? Because I'm in your life. I pray with you. I talk with you. I try to encourage you. I can lay out every problem of the people that have left this group. And it's because I care. Now, we can't say, and I can say, I can say, I, God, Jesus, I love you because I love your people. I'm giving all I can for your people. I'm not holding back. I'm not putting myself first. I'm doing everything I possibly can. I know for sure. You, everyone in this group needs to check their heart and ask himself, have I been consumed in my own life? Have I been overwhelmed with my own problems and issues and desires? Have I been seeking my own? If you say yes to any of that, repent. Believe me, if you keep focusing on your problems, they'll only magnify and get bigger. You need to get out of your head and start helping other people because all the gifts are God, of God are given to us to benefit the body. So how can you be benefiting the body if you're not intimately activated and equipping the body and helping the body? If you're not doing that, then the power of the Holy Spirit is not flowing through you and then you're drying up. You're becoming dry bones. Because you have to be serving people to have a good relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to be serving people in order to have the fullness of the walk of Christ. How many people have their walks with God die because you're just so selfish and they sit there like a lump on a log and they think that's the Christian walk? You're not saved to serve yourself. You're saved to serve each other. We have to change. This, this ministry is literally on its last leg and dying. But don't worry, everybody's going to sit home and think about themselves. And what good does that do for the body of Christ? Not a single thing. So I am asking everybody, pray about it, check your hearts, repent of it, realize it's a, not an occasion, it's a lifestyle. It's not something we do to prove to God that we do one good thing a week. 
It's what we do. It's who we are. It's our life. Now, Jesus went through great measure to show this, these, these, these examples of respect and honoring his disciples and then also required them from those who invited him to his house, right? How should we treat each other? Bear one another's burdens. Confess your faults to one another, right? Build each other up. Call each other out. Bring each other back. Challenge one another, one another in the faith. But if I ever hear anybody ever say to me again, I'm going to lose it because it's like, oh, you know, it's just not me. It's not what I do. Who cares? I don't care. Change, 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 and change. Be like Jesus. You're not being saved to be like you. You're being saved to be like him. I, man, I so want to just go to a mountain and live in the, alone. I so do. I promise you that. If I can move farther out, I would. But the problem is, is I can't do that, even though I want to, because people aren't there and I have to be here to serve people because that's what makes my God happy. And if you're not actively seeking out your day, how to make your God happy, then you are failing in your walk. OK, and so if you want to have a good walk, if you want to get over the humps, if you want to have fire in your belly, if you want to have desire with Christ, if you want to feel close to God, you have to start serving each other. There is no way out of it. You have to serve one another. It doesn't mean you don't have personal time or things you can do for yourself. I'm just saying your life is serving each other. Your break is taking care of yourself. We, there's times to take care of yourself, but we have it so flip-flopped in the body of Christ right now that we treat the church like a movie theater. We're going to go get mine. I'm going to get entertained. I'm going to get a warm fuzzy, and I'm going to be a little heathen and run back out into the world and find other ways to be entertained and fulfilled. No, that's not the Christian way. The Christian way is to build in each other's lives and try to fulfill each other's lives. Marriage is no different. If my whole walk with my wife was trying to make myself happy and never looking out for her needs and just getting mine, how long do you think that marriage would last? She would get tired of being used. She would be hurt. Rightfully so. The body of Christ is no different. We have to understand that we're there to be there for the other person and not ourselves, to prefer one another, to build each other up. My wife and Angel are very upset that they feel like they're the only ones on group me. Because nobody else has the time. It's ridiculous. So I'm asking, if you love Jesus, love me. If you love Jesus, love each other. Don't tell me you love Jesus if you can't love the body of Christ. What you will not do for the body of Christ is what you won't do for Jesus. It's that simple. So if you're failing the body of Christ, you're failing Jesus. That is the truth. That is the absolute God's honest truth. You don't like that? Repent, change, ask for help, put in some effort. I promise you, your walk with God will become much livelier, much more fulfilled, and much more blessed. Don't try to point out the problems. Be the answer to the problem. Be what you want other people to be. Set the example. Someone has to. So I believe everybody in this group loves Jesus. But I also believe everybody in this group, including myself, have, has been a, a student of this world. And we have been taught certain things. And we have to unlearn them. We have to be untaught and learn new things. And let our hearts be changed and to be like Jesus, to love Jesus. Right? Now, when he comes back, what did he say? And when the sheep's and the goats, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Right. So when he comes back and he goes, hey, so-and-so in this group, did you love the body of Christ? What are you going to say? Well, no, not really. I was busy. You know, I went on vacation. I had so much problems going on in my life. I couldn't take a second to look my head up and look around and see that other people are hurting worse than I'm hurting. Right? It's wrong. We need to repent. So if you love Jesus, if you're inviting Jesus for dinner, just realize you're invited the entire body of Christ with you. And that that same honor, that same love, that same respect you give Jesus is what you have to give the body of Christ. 
failure to do so is not only hurting the body, it's hurting Jesus, and it's hurting you because you were not built for selfishness. You were built to be machines and operators of love. So that's the thing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you so much for all you have our and will ever do for us. We exalt you, lift you up, help us to love one another, to be there for each other, to love people like we say we love you. And like put, you know, put some fruit to this word and you know, put some action to our thoughts and feelings so we can glorify your name and lift you up. So give us the strength, give us the Holy Spirit. We repent of any shortcomings that we have. We ask to be renewed in your might and your power to stop being selfish, to stop looking at ourselves, to stop being consumed with our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own desires, and start looking outward to a world that's hurting, to a body of Christ that needs love and encouragement, a lonely body of Christ, and a dying body of Christ, Father. So help us to be doctors and operators of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. Brotherlance.com